So we have another story from the Old Testament this morning that highlights again our humanity, again God sending people into our lives that breaks into that humanity to begin the process of transformation. So the fascinating thing about Naaman is that he is a, he is a commander. He has all the decorations, all the honor and power that a man could have. But yet he fails to recognize the voice of God contained in the slave girl. Now the slave girl has no interest from the outside to care for Naaman. She, after all, is captive. She's a servant to his wife. She doesn't have to say, I know a way that you can be healed. But she does. But Naaman doesn't really want to go do what the instructions are. Because he thinks, well, first of all, they didn't come to me like I was a commander in chief. Second of all, why would I go down to the Jordan when Abana and Barfar are much better rivers than the Jordan, which is wild and cannot be tamed. And those rivers are lush and green and beautiful. They have aqueducts that help control the flow of water so that it could flow into the cities. No, it seems as if Naaman wants a little bit more complicated way to be healed. But those rivers represent a truth for all of us that we cannot control God, that we may not always be in control of our situations, of our healings, of our transformation, that we must allow God to do that. And we must allow the voices of those for whom we may deem don't have a voice to come into our lives and be a part of that transformation, a part of the salvation that God intends for us. It's all about a new way, a new life, a new way of living for God with Christ, a new way of living amongst God's people requires us to look at others as maybe prophets in our own lives. Maybe requires us to listen and to be looking for God, the voice of God, everywhere. We don't know whom or how or when someone may come into our lives and invite us to a deeper transformation And if we're not careful, we may disregard that voice because it doesn't come from me or Father Rob or a big name person. But it came, it may come from a slave girl. It may come from a young child. It may come from someone who we've never heard of, someone who we may not even think has a voice at all. But yet it comes. And the question is, will, will we listen? The slave girl's voice, for whatever reason, softens Naaman's heart. He listens to her. And he does go and dip in the Jordan seven times, and he is healed.
so two stories that come to mind that help illustrate that. One is my own. It was Easter Day in my home church. And the week before, as I sang in the choir, parts were given out for parts of the Psalms, some of the canticles that would be sung. And I didn't get to sing, chant the part that I wanted the part to chant. Organist gave it to somebody else. And I thought I was the stuff chanting. <laughs> I did. You know, I was good at it. I thought I should have had the chance to do that. But at that point, I was chanting everything. And my sneaking suspicion is this organist said, it's time for you to let someone else do that particular thing. This is doing Holy Week now. <laughs> I was a little ticked. <laughs> I was a lot ticked. <laughs> I wrestled with this for three days to hope the triduum, I wrestled with pride and being a little upset, I didn't get asked to chant that. So God worked with my spirit. You know, you need to, really need to be ashamed of yourself. You're not the only one that can chant this, but I'm the only one that can chant it well. <laughs> the Lord has knocked me down several pegs, y'all, I'm just saying. And that was the beginning of part of my transformation of, I ain't the only one that can chant something. That others have the gift and need the opportunity to learn and to share and to grow just as I did. But I would not have thought that on Easter Sunday morning, as I got up really early, for whatever reason, the Daystar channel was on and I don't watch the Daystar channel. And T.D. Jakes was preaching his Easter sermon that morning. And the voice of God hit me like a lightning bolt. Those things that I realized that were prideful, I just said, you know, this is okay. This is okay. It was so powerful that Instead of being still angry and a little bit offended, I went to Easter Mass that morning with joy, with humility, with gratefulness to God that he knocked me down several pegs before I had to go among the people of God and proclaim that Christ was risen and he was risen indeed. Now, the guy who chanted the piece of music, he didn't do a really great job. Just being honest. <laughs> but what was different was my attitude. What was different was that because I listened to a man whom I would never have listened to a sermon by him on Easter Day, I don't even know why the TV was on that channel. James probably turned it to that channel. But I listened. I said, God, this is me. I'm sorry, transform me, make me different, especially on Easter Day. Second story. A church is, was full of a lot of really educated people. I mean really educated people. And over time, some everyday folk, some folk with less degrees and a little less status, a little less stuff, began to be attracted to this parish. But when she did that, she found a little resistance. You're really not like us. You're a little different than we are. But she kept coming because she liked the worship. She liked the people who were kind to her, and there were some who were not. But she intended to stay and be who God had called her to be in this place. 
So Christmas comes, and they have a Christmas party for the children. Every child got a little gift from her, really from the church, but she had purchased it and given it out in the name of the church. And so she knew this particular woman who really had a real problem with her, really bothered her that she was there. She knew that her granddaughter would be in town for the holidays. And so she thought about her granddaughter. So the time came after mass for the gifts to be given out and all the goodies that talked about Christmas. And she got her, the, the lady who didn't care for this other woman, grabbed her granddaughter's hand and said, well, let's go. This is not for you and I. This is for the other kids. So April went and said, wait, Miss Smith. You don't have to go. I've got something for your granddaughter, too. And she looked at her as if bewildered. Why would you think of us? And she said, because your granddaughter's in town. I knew she would be in town with you for the holiday, so I included her too. I can imagine that Miss Smith must have looked at April like Naaman must have looked at that slave girl. She had no reason to think of her because she had not been very welcoming of her. Now she was cordial like a good Episcopalian, <laughs> but she kind of got the feeling that she was not on the level of everybody else. And so listening to those who may be prophets in our lives, listening to the voice of those who have been, maybe, will be oppressed, those who suffer. Those may be the very people that God has sent into our lives to change us, to be a part of the work of transformation that is ongoing every day, every moment, with every person. It's kind of exciting to live like that because God may surprise you with who he brings to your path. He may use you as to be a prophet. He may use you to be an agent of the invitation to a new life. He may use you to help someone else know about Jesus. He may use you to go out to tell the people of the world by your life with words, if necessary, as St. Francis says, that Jesus is the only salvation we have. That no circumcision, no, no status, no commander in chief, no level of education matters in the kingdom of God. What matters is that God's people are engaged daily in the transforming life and becoming new and seeing and looking, expecting for the voice of God to be in places where we think that they may not be. We cannot control how God invites us, transforms us, who or who, who he uses to do that. But what we must do, what is within our control, is that we respond that we are grateful to be on the new path of life. So remember Naaman, slave girl. Remember Paul, circumcision is nothing. It means nothing, it's no status for pride. What matters is the work of Jesus Christ in our lives and our opportunity to welcome and invite others into the same life. Amen.